Welcome back. This is the second lecture of chapter 9. Um, I know chapter 9, lecture 1, was in two parts uh, and fairly lengthy. This one's going to be much shorter. Um, and we've already talked about in that first lecture uh, glycolysis, the prep step, and Krebs cycle. Um, and so just briefly to review that thing or those things, glycolysis remembers when you take a glucose molecule, and again, this happens in the cytoplasm, and we take one glucose, invest two ATPs during the energy investment phase to ultimately break that glucose molecule into two identical G3P molecules. At the beginning of the energy payoff phase, which is going to produce a total of four ATP, um, you're going to have to oxidize the G3Ps, which adds a phosphate in the place of the hydrogen. It produces two NADHs, which are going to go to the ETC, because uh, remember the NADH is the high energy electron carrier molecule, it acts like a taxi, and it's going to taxi those electrons and hydrogens from glycolysis in this case to the electron transport chain, which is located within the inner mitochondrial membrane uh, called the cristae. Um, but once we oxidize the G3P into um, a molecule that contains two phosphates each, then we can utilize substrate level phosphorylation to produce uh, four total ATP molecules right there in the, in the cytoplasm where they can be used for any biological reaction or any biological process. Um, at the end of glycolysis, you have two um, two uh, pyruvates, okay, remember pyruvate can also be called pyruvic acid, and that, that leads to the PrEP step. In the PrEP step, you're going to change the pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A. Remember, you're going to do the first of several oxidative decarboxylation events, and um, in the process of oxidatively decarboxylizing the pyruvate, you're going to remove a carbon dioxide and add the acetyl uh, or add the coenzyme A to the two carbon acetyl to form acetyl coenzyme A. Once the acetyl coenzyme A is produced, it, the uh, coenzyme A will usher the acetyl into the Krebs cycle where ultimately large amounts of NADHs are made, uh, specifically six per glucose, um, and uh, two molecules of FADH2 will be produced. All of the NADH and FADH2 produced during the uh, glycolysis, prep step, and Krebs will all travel to the ETC and chemiosmosis in order to produce huge amounts of ATP. Okay, the goal of chemiosmosis is to produce huge amounts of ATP. Now, we've already talked about producing a little bit of ATP using substrate level phosphorylation but we only produced four total ATPs after investing two. So we only netted two ATPs per glucose out there during glycolysis, um, which isn't very many. Okay, In fact, we're going to produce up to 36 ATPs just during chemiosmosis alone. Okay, That's large amounts of ATP, and you know by now that uh, chemiosmosis is that, that process that requires the ATP synthase. Okay, So here is... The electron transport chain, this portion of the diagram is the electron transport chain, and this portion is the ATP synthase portion. All of this together is what we call chemiosmosis, and chemiosmosis is a process of producing large amounts of ATP right here in the inner mitochondrial membrane called the matrix. Okay, and so what's going to happen is all the NADHs and FADH2s that are produced from glycolysis and the Krebs and the transition reaction or PrEP step are going to come in here to the matrix and are going to drop off the two electrons and hydrogen ion that it is carrying. When the electrons enter this first protein complex that is embedded in the mitochondrial membrane, it's going to gradually release energy, just like it did in the photosynthesis electron transport chain. As the electrons release energy gradually, like a slinky going downstairs, the energy is going to be utilized right then and there to transport the hydrogen ions from the low side to the high side. Now, we know by now in this class that moving from low too high is an active transport process and so we're actively transporting these hydrogen ions from low to high using the energy given off from the electrons gradually over time so we're going to actively pump hydrogen ions here actively pump them here 
actively transport them here to maintain this high concentration gradient on this inner membrane space, which is the space between the two membranes. We're going to maintain the low concentration in the matrix because we're actively transporting these hydrogen ions to this side, meaning this side will remain low. Once the hydrogens are um, basically pumped to this high concentration side, they're going to flow through ATP synthase like we've always talked about it doing, which is going to phosphorylate this ADP, meaning we're going to add a phosphate to ADP, creating ATP. And every time three molecule or three hydrogen ions move through the ATP synthase enzyme, we're going to produce one ATP. Okay? Um, and so you're, you're going to have a ton uh, of NADH molecules and FADH2 molecules consistently traveling from glycolysis, prep step, and Krebs to this first protein complex, um, constantly releasing these H plus ions to this high side using the energy gradually released from these electrons um, as, it, as it walks down the electron transport chain. Once the electrons reach the end of this electron transport chain, it is going to be accepted by the final electron acceptor, which in cell respiration's case is oxygen. Okay, why do we breathe in oxygen? Because we need oxygen to accept these low energy electrons. And as you consistently breathe in oxygen, this oxygen is going to diffuse into the blood from your lungs and it's going to diffuse into every cell of every tissue that makes up you and it's going to be used as this final electron acceptor within the mitochondria of those cells. These electrons are going to be accepted by hydro or the uh, oxygen, the hydrogen ions will be accepted by the oxygen, and we produce water as a byproduct. And you know that when you breathe out or exhale, you're breathing out water. Okay, where does that water come from? The water is produced by you at this point in the mitochondria uh, because, again, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. You are utilizing oxygen to, uh, to remove these low-energy electrons and hydrogen ions from this low side in order to get rid of those electrons. And so high water will be released to the atmosphere every time you exhale. That is chemiosmosis. It happens in the, uh, the cristae membrane. Now, we talked about chemiosmosis being the final stage of cellular respiration all of the NADHs and FADH2s that are produced throughout uh, cell respiration are going to transfer electrons and hydrogens to the cristae membrane. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It's going to accept the electrons and hydrogen ions to form water. Once water is, uh, is produced, you're going to release uh, or release water to rid yourself of these low energy electrons and hydrogen ions um, and so it is, like I said, water is one of those uh, gas or uh, vapor products, one of those uh, waste gases of cellular respiration, the other one being carbon dioxide. So let's talk about the totals produced during this entire cell respiration process. I've talked in my class a lot about the difference between gross and net uh, in terms of like profits and that kind of thing. And so if we think about gross ATP produced, during the entire process of cell respiration, you're going to get 38 total ATPs produced. Now, we're going to invest two ATPs, and I'm not talking about two ATPs invested during glycolysis, even though we are. Um, we're saying that two ATPs are net gained during glycolysis. We have to invest an additional zero to two ATPs to shuttle all of these um, NADHs from the cytoplasm all the way to the electron transport chain. So sometimes depending on how efficient the cell is you don't have to spend any, sometimes you have to spend a lot um, in terms of you have to spend two. Okay, so we're going to invest up to two, we're going to make two ATPs by substrate level phosphorylation in the glycolysis process, we're going to produce two in the Krebs, and we're going to produce about 34 ATPs by chemiosmotic phosphorylation, which is that chemiosmosis process. And so if you add the 34 plus the 2 plus the 2, you get a total net, um, or I should say a total of 38, but because we have to invest 2, you're going to take that away. And so 36 is the magical number. 36 ATPs are produced per glucose during the, uh, during the cell respiration process. Here is another way of looking at it. 
we are going to turn glucose into pyruvate during glycolysis. We're going to produce a net of two ATPs. We're going to also produce two NADHs, which will eventually give us a total of four ATPs during chemiosmosis um, at the electron transport chain. During the prep step, turning pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A, we're going to make two NADHs, which will yield us additional six ATPs at chemiosmosis um, and the chemiosmotic phosphorylation process. Once you start the Krebs cycle, we're going to produce two ATPs total directly from that process, but we're also going to produce six NADHs and two FADH2s, which are going to give us 18 and four additional ATPs during uh, that chemiosmosis phosphorylation process, and so we get a total net of 36 ATPs during this entire uh, cell respiration process. That'll do it for this one. Bring your questions to class. See ya.